My work primarily over the last 10 years has been in West Africa, particularly in Western Central Africa, particularly in oil producing regions. So the key resource in my own work is petroleum, oil and gas. And uh, that's of course a very contested resource in all sorts of ways. The area that I've conducted a great deal of work is in the Niger Delta, one of the major oil producing regions of the world. Um, Nigeria produces a couple of million barrels a day, uh, feeds the North American market for the most part. And that part of the, uh, the oil producing fields in the Niger Delta have been really the subject and the object of enormously contentious politics culminating in the period between 2006 and 2009 in an insurgency. I've been working in what are called host communities in the Delta. That's to say they have some type of presence, could be a part of an oil field, could be an oil well, it could be a pipeline, some physical presence of the oil industry within their territory. Um, so one of the things I've been doing is looking at the types of conflicts that emerge within those host communities. They can be of various sorts. One is often between the community or segments of the community and the oil companies. Um, my case, Chevron, uh, BP, uh, Agip. And often the conflicts there are over the agreements that are purportedly made, memoranda of understanding they're called, between the company, which is obliged to provide all sorts of things, in community, including community outreach and community development resources, and the community. And often there's a feeling of duplicity or grievance that things don't come through as they should. Um, and they're often very contentious, not necessarily between, and these are villages for the most part, not necessarily between village leaders or chiefs and the companies, that certainly happens, but often between um, what are called youth, young men in particular, they're often members of cultural associations who feel that um, the real problem is actually the chiefs themselves. That they're appropriating the monies and they can be very substantial in local terms. And so some of the conflicts aren't just between chiefs and companies. They're between often armed and very angry and very pissed off young men and their customary chiefs who they feel are, as it were, feeding at the trough and not spending resources in a collective or community way. Well, there are lots of things, I think, um, that are rightly the object of contention, and the Institute of Development Studies here is leading that. One, of course, in any, let's just take oil and gas, which is a global community uh, uh, resource, a um, strategic resource. Um, one of those issues, of course, are land and land rights. And there's an enormous amount of just not only conflict, but also juridical ambiguity over who has the land rights. And of course, that's part of this whole debate over land grabbing, dispossession, and so on. Now, we know a lot about that, although I think there's more to be done there, particularly on the prescriptive end, which is to say, what institutions do you need to build to provide the transparency, to provide the types of legibility that is required? And I think, to be honest with you, on the academic side, we've been strong on the critique I'll tell you who's doing bad stuff to whom, without necessarily um, being clear on the prescriptive side. And since I'm mentioning land, I think one of the de default positions by academics goes something like this. Well, lots of dispossession, um, companies are not good, chiefs are corrupt, um, let's fall back on something called traditional institutions or customary law, as if this were some model of democratic practice that we can now either revive because it's become a bit dormant or alternatively just use. And of course, well not of course, my own view is that's deeply problematic. So I think that's one example of something that we do know about, but perhaps we need to think about in a different way. That would be one. The other issue I think, for me, I've tried to work on a lot over the, over the years, is that a part of the reason why these conflicts emerge in the first place is precisely because, and it could be irrespective of whether it's young men, irrespective of whether it's criminal groups trying to steal oil or nasty security forces, um, particularly in a place like Nigeria, which are both corrupt and rather violent and they step into the mix here, whatever the agents and actors are, the institutions of which they're part, their legitimacy is in question. It could be chiefs, it could be local government, it could be the federal government, could be, but the whole question then of authority, 
who has it, what institutions is it vested in, and the degree to which over time those institutions have been seen to become more illegitimate with the result that many people who feel that they have claims over resources are actually excluded from those institutions. And then in my book, you've got trouble. You've got lots of folks who feel that whatever the institutions are, religious, political, civic, they're not part of the conversation. So I've, I think that's a whole arena, and this conference we're in the midst of right here, um, just in the first papers and so on, you can see that that institutional, let's call it the intersection of politics and institutions, big deal. But I think it's going to have to be bridged on a long a number of fronts. Uh, let me just make one, not controversial comment, but um, uh, one comment before I explain that. And that is that um, there's often a default position by academics that there's a policy constituency and there's a set of problems um, and the conversation isn't happening or it's happening in an and the default position is often that there are community groups or civic groups that are going to either take up the slack or should assume the responsibility. Now, I'd be the last person in the world to knock civic groups and nonprofits and so on. Um, but I don't think they're always the answer. And indeed, one of the things I think we've seen over the last decade or so is that the boundaries between government and civic groups, between companies and civic groups, have become very porous. Um, and I think this is a part of the problem now, is that there's a number of actors and agents that are going to enter into that policy discussion. Um, that landscape has been shifting. You know, you have an institution 20 years ago was insignificant. The uh, Gates Foundation now throws around a lot of money and makes the World Bank and quantitatively look pretty trivial. To say nothing of, you know, uh, DFID in the UK or USAID where I come from. So it's a changing landscape. So I think the larger context for your question would be, I think, and this, this is partly an academic issue and it's partly a political issue, is that the landscape is shifting, it's complicated. And uh, I think this, that's one thing we need to bear in, bear in mind. Specifically on this question that you posed on policy on the one side, as it were, and scholarship on, on the other. I mean, I think one thing that I would emphasize is that uh, there needs to be some type of conversation and a language that translates a lot of the concerns that activist groups may have uh, into what in certain policy spheres seems a very elevated, um, apolitical type of discussion. And wh wh where I'm going with here is that one of the things we've talked about in this conference already is how among many development constituencies, there's now a call for doing politically smart development. I think what that's about is what I'm calling this language. You know, I mean, I'm a man of the left, and I have all sorts of questions about the presumption that free markets can do anything. But uh, to, as a starting point, um, to, for example, reject markets to core might be a very um, tricky starting point for a conversation with a policy constituency. So again, I think that's for me this uh, had to do with this ground on which the, the type of conversation needs to happen and the language that it needs to happen. That example that I gave of the, the institutional landscape and the complexities of the relationships between them, the fact that an oil company in Nigeria works with all manner of civic groups, funds them. Right? And those, they could be international NGOs, they could be they could be very, very small, low, local, little community groups and everything in between. And Chevron itself also joint funds with the Nigerian government. It also has backing in some cases from UNDP. But what a complicated entity that is. Um, so it's precisely, yeah, I think it's precisely trying to understand that and figuring out a language and a set of practices appropriate to that new dispensation, if you like. When this came about in 2000, I was one of the many academics who poo-pooed this. Oh, well, this is another global multilateral effort to raise a bunch of money. We've got these eight goals and they're all fine and dandy. I was very skeptical, to be honest with you. But a couple of things changed my mind. One was that, of course, those original goals were part of a conceptual discussion. Um, it's all really well to say I'm going to reduce poverty, extreme poverty, uh, by 2015 or whatever. 
But then, of course, that was part of a conversation about, well, how exactly do you measure poverty? Uh, well, there's a whole panoply of ways of doing that, and one of the things you have to do is get away from you know, income, consumption expenditure measures. There's a whole bunch, a raft of measures, concepts, indices that came out of the human development, uh, UNDP and the uh, Human Development Index, which is to say that it opened up a discussion, conceptual, about how to think about, talk about, and the things that one should be focusing on in such a goal. Now, again, I don't want to sort of hold up 2015 as being a marvelous success story apropos MDGs, but the fact remains that it's become a hugely important forum. Um, and uh, whatever unevennesses there may be in the achievements, I, I, I'd be the last person to say it's not important. So we jump then to these sustainable goals, and already you see there's a big debate, it's happening this month in the UN, over how many and what type of new goals should there be under the rubric of sustainability. Well, it could be 17, could be 23. Last I saw was 169 within those 17 goals ways of conceiving, measuring, indexing these important things. That may seem unbelievably abstruse, but in actual fact, that's exactly what you were suggesting. It's going to be, or it can be, about a, a different type of discussion about access, control, violence, conflict, institution building. Well, there are two or three, I suppose. One would be, and don't forget this constituency that's at this conference, and IDS historically in general, um, stands in a particular relationship to what one might call conventional policy making, conventional prescription, conventional development theory. It's also, it's always been, an, dare I use the term since I live near Silicon Valley, it's an incubator of quite progressive and radical and probably left of center ideas. The constituency at this um, STEPS conference is precisely an intriguing mix of academics, scholars, historians, activists, social movement people. So you've got an interesting mix there. So I think given that mix, one, of, one or two of the things that I would emphasize here would be the following. One is we need to be careful about just falling back into a type of comfortable and sometimes smug and self-satisfied set of positions about critique versus um, a serious discussion of alternatives. And I think that involves, as I was trying to say today in my remarks, thinking critically about a set of concepts that seemingly have now become very widely accepted, are powerful. This notion of resiliency, well, global climate change, we all have to adapt and adapt now. One of the things I said, let's be careful. You know, language isn't innocent, concepts aren't innocent, and we need to think very carefully about just invoking this idea of resilience, the power to, um, to rebound from a shock, something bad, that, those capabilities, when in fact there's part and parcel of a parallel set of discourses and practices that are about security and that are about the market. So what I was trying to say is, be careful. Let's be careful here with our toolkit. That's one thing. The second thing is that I'd emphasize would be again, I, I try to do this, um, would be to say, I think there's a general recognition, and one can see it in the sustainable development goals uh, that you've been talking about, is that there's a way in which different types of communities need to do, quote, politically smart development, unquote. To me, that's a buzz, a catchword for simply saying, we need to be thinking about power and influence and collective interests. And what are these things called political settlements? And when we say, well, this is an inclusive political coalition and that's an exclusive, well, what does this mean for the type of work that we do? And frankly, I don't think we're there yet. So I think yeah, that sounds highfalutin to talk about power and politics, but I think it's central to our discussions. And I'm struck by the fact that the, uh, the World Bank uh, produces a big annual compendium and I was just at a meeting in, in Washington about this, and the theme for this coming year is governance and law. Now that seems anodyne, right? But it's interesting. The directors got up and said, well, you know, why we're doing this is because for many constituencies, NGOs, is that we've, there's a clamor for us, the bank, to take power in politics seriously. Interesting. 
the World Bank. Well, of course, they are an embodiment of power. What they were saying, however, in so, so much of their prescriptive work, right? they either don't acknowledge their own power, or there's a way in which their de development interventions are not coming to terms with this question of doing politically smart development. So those are two issues that, um, you know, if, if I were some type of emperor in the development world, which thank God I'm not. Uh, th those were the things I would, I would flag, and I think they're complicated issues, but I think they're on the agenda, and I think your question to me about the sustainable development goals is as good a forum as any as exploring both. I think the challenges are around um, empirically, if that's what you're asking me. I mean, there's clearly a number of key issues here. Right? One, obviously, is around around the question of land, land grabbing, dispossession, land titling, complicated set of land-based issues. And we're not sure, or let me put it this way, I'm not sure whether this whole land grabbing debate, which came about in the wake of the 2008 commodity price increase and the co economic collapse that occurred after that, whether these sorts of land issues are a bit of a blip they're a product, actually, of some speculative activity in and around finance capital that was looking for places to dump money. So is it just a blip? Or is this actually a structural and longer-term issue which got... But either way, it seems to me that that land issue is certainly uh, incontestably one. Already we've seen in the, co in the conference the fact that we open our newspapers and on the front page is a three-year-old boy washing up on the shores of Bodrum. 60 million people, 20 million refugees, 40 million displaced, historically unprecedented, wrapped up with complicated, yes, conflicts, yes, um, civil war, but also a set of desperate circumstances that are driving migrants, not necessarily from conflicted zones, but in resource poor zones. I think this clearly is going, this isn't going away. It's absolutely not going away, and there's every reason, as we've seen in some of the failed efforts to, you know, to, for, for collective global cooperation on this, uh, it can actually get worse before it gets better. So though clearly these are at base resource questions in all sorts of ways, and I think it's going to take a variety of forms in a variety of ways. And the last thing I'd say is that the, the, as an opportunity, again, I think um, it needn't be th per se through the sustainable development goals, but I think this question of thinking about doing development differently, it's a cliche, I know, been here before, but the ways in which now, um, and perhaps it's not unrelated uh, in some curious way, to the events since 2008-9, you know, the inequality debate, the Occupy movement, the 1%, all of this stuff, which seems like very much a, 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 a global north issue. I th in my own mind, this is very much wrapped up with power politics, social class, and other types of interests. And, and I think that that's a central, uh, a central issue in the discussions that, that have been happening here in the development arena. And maybe for that reason now there are some complicated resonances you know, between the fact that, um, that for, along the, virtually any dimension of human development or conflict or violence, being a young black man in part of the world that I live, in West Oakland, isn't terribly different from being a young Bangladeshi in a slum in Bangladesh in terms of their life chances, in terms of their situation, vis-a-vis -vis institutions of authority, being excluded from, et cetera, et cetera. And that resonance and connection may provide something quite new and different in terms of how we think about all of these issues that you've raised with me.